Welcome to Artist on Lockdown. I'm Ron Onesti from the Arcata Theater in St. Charles, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. And my guest tonight, he's one of the founders of a founding band of psychedelic rock, Vanilla Fudge, and the cult band Cactus. He backed on the drums, the best of the best, including Ozzy Osbourne, Jeff Beck, Rod Stewart, and he's jammed with so many other legends, from Jimi Hendrix to Led Zeppelin tonight. We are hanging and banging with my buddy, Carmine Apice. How you doing, buddy? Hey, man, I'm good. How you doing? Uh, you know what? This is so cool for me, and I know for everybody out there, but I am such a fan and uh, to be with you tonight and to be able to do this, I just got to thank Steve and Ben and everybody and you for allowing me this time with one of my rock and roll heroes. Oh, thank you so much. I mean, how many times have I played your venues? I mean, we love playing with you. You're the, you're the greatest promoter. You, know, <laughs> you always treat the bands great. You know, and you make some great food. Your meatballs <laughs> are awesome. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, man. You know, again, we're, we're excited to have you guys. I mean, you've almost become the house band some years between <laughs> Fudge and all the other pro uh, projects yeah. you're doing. I mean, Drum Wars with your brother, yeah. Vinny. I just love that project. And the yeah. Project Cactus that you put together, uh, we're, we're just about to put it together at the Arcada. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But, yeah. um, you know, you just, you've had so many incredible experiences over the last 50 plus years in the biz. And I tell you, your book, Stick It, My Life of Sex, Drums, and Rock and Roll, is an amazing, a great read. It's an amazing recollection of all these great stories. And uh, it's, it's if you're a rock and roll fan, this is like must read TV, this book. Yeah, thank you. Hey, you notice on that cover, I'm wearing a red lace top. <laughs> Uh, you know what? You, oh, that's right. It's a red lace. I didn't realize that. It's red lace top. And made by that was the, that was the deal Mike. back then, right? Yeah, uh, made by my friend Mike uh, Vaughn, who, who went on to make Jimi Hendrix's clothes. We oh. turned Jimi Hendrix on to him. And every time I see that book cover, I think I, that's a red lace top. Come on, dude. Very you know fast. <laughs> it worked then, it works now. And I, next time you're at the Arcada, I want to see you. I never uh, thought I'd say this to another man, I, I can't but I want to see you in that red lace top. <laughs> I can't fit in it. <laughs> so let's go back to those early years in the 60s when you were rocking with Vanilla Fudge. Um, I mean, it's really something how you guys just blew up. And, you know, having people like, I don't know, Led Zeppelin open up for you? They did, but... Uh... You know, we, we went on with everybody. We played with Led Zeppelin, I mean, uh, let's say Hendrix and The Cream and uh, all those kind of bands. And we used to blow everybody off, you know? And we always said, who's going to blow us off? Led Zeppelin. They're the first band to actually blow us off. So you were traveling with so many of these guys, too, at the Kinetic Playground, Jethro Tull. I mean, some yeah. of these these um, these shows that you did were like World Series of Rock 10 years before, 20 years before. Yeah, and that, that, that Kinetic Playground gig was great because you had Jethro Tull opening up, Led Zeppelin in the middle, and Vanilla Fudge headlining. So you Jeez. have Clyde Bunker. Clyde Bunker was the uh, drummer of Jethro Tull. He was a Ludwig artist. We were, uh, we were all Ludwig artists. So then you had John Bonham, a Ludwig artist, and then me, a Ludwig artist. So, so when Jethro Tull was on, me and John would stand behind Clive and we'd make stick ball, spitballs. <laughs> we'd throw <laughs> spitballs at, at Clive, you know? And then when John went on, me and Clive stood behind John and we threw spitballs at him. And of course, when I went on with Fudge, they threw spitballs at me too. So it was pretty wild, but, and I remember distinctly that night, Ludwig gave us all some brand new heavy duty um, pedals, I believe, and some heavy duty stands. And at, by the end of the night, we had broken them and gave it back to Ludwig and said, you have to make it stronger. You know, so I'll always remember that night. Well, see, now, if it was today, spitballs, broken drums, they'd all be on eBay. That's the difference, right? <laughs> they'd be worth something, right? That's true, yeah. So back then, I mean, you're talking these names like they were just, you know, your buddies. 
was it more of a competitive environment or was it more of a camaraderie that you guys had? More of a camaraderie. It wasn't really a big business yet, you know? And it, it was like, you know, we were all friends. Like I helped John Bonham get his endorsement with Ludwig. Uh, Led Zeppelin was uh, our manager, was friends with Peter Grant. And that's why, and we had the same attorney, you know, so that's why Zeppelin got on our tour. We heard their album way before it came out. And, and our manager said, it's Jimmy Page's band. We knew Jimmy Page. We used to play with the Oddbirds, you know, and uh, Jimmy was in the Oddbirds and, and we did gigs with them, a lot of gigs actually. So when he came out with the new band and we heard the album, we said, yeah, we'd like, we'd love them to open up, you know, and they did. And we all became really great friends, you know, and Jethro Tull, uh, I think Clyde was the most friendly of that crew. <clears throat> he was the one that we hung out, as I did especially, mostly with Clyde, you know. So me, Clive, and, and Bonzo would, would hang out, you know, before the show, after the show, because we're the drummers, you know. So hanging out with Zeppelin, hanging out with these guys, you've got a lot of downtime. You've got a lot of great experiences. And I don't even know if I should bring this one up, but this is a big thing in the book. This is a legendary night that you had uh, with with uh, uh, Bonham, with John Paul Jones, with the rest of the Zeppelin guys, and a, a mud shark. Oh, no. <laughs> it's funny because that, that night was just a, a crazy night. It was a day off, and it was a groupie that I had originally found. And uh, we went to play the Seattle Pop Festival. Next day, we had a day off. And, you know, she she came back and she ended up with the roadies overnight. And then the day, we had a day off. So we were on the water at the Edgewater Inn. You could fish out the window, right? So, you know, some of the guys went and bought some fishing tackle. It was John Bonham, his wife. Uh, Bruce Wayne was our roadie. It was like Batman. Like <laughs> and, and And Richard Cole. And uh, they were fishing out of the, their window. And we were in uh, John Paul Jones' room. We were, we were doing uh, uh, watching TV with the sound off, listening to Delaney and Bonnie and all that. We were smoking some pot and all that. And there's a knock on the door. And there's this groupie chick comes in. You know, she'd been still hanging around with us. So she came in. And nobody thought anything of it. So we're all hanging out in there. It was Tim Bogart, myself. Uh, I don't know. It might have been a couple other girls. And... and uh, then the, there's a knock on the door, and in comes the other guys from next door with this mud shark fish. And following them in is Mark Stein, a keyboard player with an eight millimeter camera. And then the, all this crazy stuff started. It was, it was, it, I can't even talk about it. it was I don't want to get a visual here. I just can't. It, it's the most disgusting, craziest thing I've ever seen in my life. And then. Then we moved out of there because the, it was so crazy. We got the doors open, everybody screaming and yelling. The manager came down and said, break this up, break this up. Okay, so so me and John Paul Jones went to uh, my room, all right? And, uh, and John's, wearing, uh, John's in my room, and me and Tim and John. Next thing we know, the chick bangs on the door. And she's wearing John's robe, and she, she comes to my room. And then... Then the other guys all followed. And so now the scene is in my room. And this was so disgusting. I said, I got to get out of this room. And I said, I realize this is my room. I said, Tim, I'm coming into your room. <laughs> so oh I went and God. stayed the night in Tim's room the next night. I can't believe a song, Mud Shark, has never emerged from this experience. It, I don't... it, did, it did emerge by it did. Frank Zappa. Ah, he was there. <laughs> no, he wasn't there, but the... That night or the next day, we were going to another gig and we flew into Chicago. Okay, and, I remember. And we flew into O'Hare, and we ran into Frank and the mothers in in the in the airport. And so Frank, you know, we were friends with Frank. So Frank said to me, and uh, probably Mark Stein, go, "How you guys doing?" I said, "Oh man, we're so fuck, so fried. <laughs> we didn't sleep much last night. Why not?" And we told him the story. Next thing you know. Frank Zappa live at the Fillmore. It's a, show, a song called Mud Shark. Then really? with a funky groove. And he's got you know, these background singers going, Mud Shark. And then he'd tell the story. You know, he'd like talk the story. You know, 
if you were a groupie and you're in Seattle with vanilla fudge, you know, and they, and they talk it, it was awesome. You know, you know Dweezil, uh, Dweezil plays us uh, quite often. I'm going to ask him to revive that song maybe. I don't know. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, well, Dweezil's, um, on, Dweezil's on my Katarzyz record too. Oh, just a great he, guy he is. He is a great guy. Yeah, he came so in humble, and, you know. He rocked. So also in the book, you know, we t you talk a little bit about your early management having something to do with the outfit. How did that happen? Well, that's interesting, too, because uh, it started when I, I played this club called The Shell House. I played the four weekends. The first two weekends I played there, it was regular guys. Second two weekends I get there, it looked like all these mafia guys took over the place. They were wearing like black turtlenecks and, and uh, sport jackets. So when I get to get, I went to get paid, and I knocked on the door, and I go, "Who is it?" I go, "It's the band. I want to get paid." And they said, "Come on in." And I, a really heavy, you know, New York accent, heavy Brooklyn accent, and I said, "Just wait over there. Wait over there." And then this guy comes out, Phil. He's got a scar on his face, and his, his partner Chubby comes out, and they go, "Oh, you in the band? Yeah, good job." And they paid me. It was no big deal. Next weekend, the same thing. A couple of months later, I get uh, the Pigeons, which was Vanilla Fudge. Mark Stein and Tim Boga come into a club I was playing at and asked me to join their band. They said, come out to a manager's club, the Action House. Now, this is like six months later. And the Action House had really become a famous club with the Vagrants playing there. And they were packing the place out, you know. So I go out there and we have a rehearsal. Then I meet the manager. It's this guy, Philly, with the scar on his face. Yo, and Philly. I, I and, know. I meet, and I meet Chubby, you know? <laughs> and Chubby was, like, the heaviest guy. This guy was asked to be, a, and the Godfather, they asked him to be a, a Luca Brazzi, but Phil said it's too close to home, so he didn't let him do it, <laughs> you know? And then these guys became our manager. So as we hung out there, you know, we noticed a lot of these mafia kind of guys hanging out. And I know the, the look, because I used to play these social clubs in Brooklyn. We were the mafia social clubs. Mm -hmm. And you know, I go, hey, your name Carmine? Yeah, hey, Italian. Yeah, hey, Pazan. And give me a $50 bill, you know? And uh, so so we met Henry Hill. Oh, wow. Right? Mm -hmm. So Henry used to come to our house and go, hey, Carmine, I got this stuff. It just fell off a truck. Oh, come on. <laughs> and he'd open up the trunk, and there'd be all this merchandise they had, I know they had Revox tape machines. At the time, they were 700 bucks a pop. I goes, is that a Revox? Yeah. I goes, wow. How much? He goes, 100 bucks for you. For you. Goes, really? I'll take two of them. <laughs> okay. Is there any warranty? He goes, yeah, I guarantee if it breaks, I'll give you another one. <laughs> <laughs> like your legs. Yeah. And then, like your legs. And then <laughs> we had to play, we had to play a gig one time for the, for the, for the crew in Brooklyn at their, at their club called Tempo Dance City. And we didn't get paid, and they kept the whole gate, you know. So it was uh, an interesting time. Well, it's interesting, uh, you know, 40 years later, approximately, in uh, 2007, you start off with the mob, and then in a crazy circle twist, um, you uh, Keep Me Hanging On becomes a cliffhanger song in The Sopranos. Exactly. Unbelievable, right? 40 and years, you know, I'll, 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 I'll life comes and, full and, circle, and, right? The funny thing about that is I lived in California mostly. I would come to the East and, and visit my girlfriend, you know, but I wasn't really into the Sopranos yet, you know. And uh, it was the very last, very last final episode. I had a, I had a, a group called Slam. Do we play your place with Slam? I, I don't Not think. yet. That's one that uh, has No, it. that's, it, it's gone. It's too much to put it together. But it was like a stomp, and, you know, buckets and trash cans and all that. It was a cool little show, so... We were rehearsing at the house I'm in now in Connecticut. So everybody was staying here. We had three extra bedrooms. We had everybody staying here so we, we can get up every day and rehearse. So they said, oh, man, it's the final episode of The Sopranos tonight. So we said, well, let's make some pasta mm -hmm. and, you know, and we'll watch it all together. So we made the pasta. We sit down to watch it. It comes on. It opens up, but you keep hanging on. And I almost choked on the pasta. Because I didn't know it was going to be on, you know, and uh, it was amazing. I used it three times in the final episode. 
Oh man, it's cool. I know. I was I was watching it last night. Really. So you oh, do really? have several. You got several other books out. Several how-to books out. And I yeah. understand that you gifted one of these books to someone that you not only it came as such a surprise, but also someone you're a little bit starstruck about. Totally starstruck. I said because you know it was, it was when I was playing with Rod. You know, Rod lived in Hollywood. He was married to Alana at the time. He, was, he used to go out with Britt Eklund. These are like Hollywood women. You know, Britt was a movie star. She knew everybody. Alana knew everyone. She was married to George Hamilton. So when we played L.A. that time, it was six nights at the Forum, and we did uh, 20,000 people a night. You know, it's a lot wow. of people. And everybody came. There was a Rolling Stones and, the, and uh, Aerosmith and Queen, and everyone is in town, plus... Tony Curtis, you know, Gregory Peck, Fred Astaire, Valerie Perrine, and many other ones. So that one night, I noticed Fred Astaire and Gregory Peck there. I mean, come on. You know, I've seen Moby Dick, I don't know how many times, and, and watched many, many Fred Astaire movies on TV. And, you know, they were there. They left. Oh, about a week later, Rod had married Alana. Alan Carr, he, he was the director of um, the movie Grease. He had a big party for Rod and Alana at his house. So we went, uh, the whole band went, and uh, the wives at the time. And I drove my big white, I had a big white Jaguar, looked like a Rolls Royce. I figured this is a good a good occasion to drive up in. You know, it something wasn't white, like it was vanilla. It was vanilla, that's right. Uh, but the interior was red, it wasn't fudge, so... Yeah, okay. But so I get out of the car and I'm walking around. All of a sudden, I see a big guy walking towards me, you know? And he comes up to me and I look and he's about six foot three, you know? He says, Hi, I'm Greg. I said, I know who you are. I said, My mother would die if she was here. It's Gregory Peck. Wow. He said, I'm Gregory Peck. Puts his hand out. So I shake his hand and I said, Wow, you know, how you doing? Good. He goes, You know, we were at the show the other night. And when you were doing your solo, I was sitting with Fred Astaire. I said, yeah, I know, I saw you guys. He said, and when you did your solo, Fred turned to me and said, this is the best solo I've seen since Gene Krupa. Wow. And I went, what? And I'm thinking to myself, you know, Gene, I said, Gene Krupa's my idol. I said, that's, that's an amazing compliment. Then I'm thinking, Fred Astaire said that, and Gregory Peck is telling me this. This is like, pinch myself, you know? And... And then he says, you know, uh, Gregor says to me, uh, Fred is a drummer. I said, no, I didn't know that. I, I, no, I didn't know that either. He said, that's why he's a good dancer. I said, wow, I didn't know that. He says, but he looks at guys like you. And he said to me, I don't know how these guys play drums like that. I don't have the faintest idea how to start. So I said, well, I have a drum book. It's called Realistic Rock. It teaches you how to play rock drums. So maybe we should give one to Fred. So so Greg says, that's a great idea. So now Gregory lived right next to Rod Stewart. They both had these big mansions, right? So we used to practice at Rod's house. And he always knew when we were there practicing because you could hear it. Mm -hmm. So he said, next time you're at Rod's house, knock on my door and give me a book and give it to Fred. I said, great. So the next time I go there, knock on his door. You ring the buzzer, these giant gates open. You walk up this long driveway. You see these, you see these uh, big, giant, like 10-foot-high you know, wood doors that look like a castle. Wizard of Oz doors. Yeah, yeah. You walk in there, and so I buzz the door. He comes to the door. I gave him a book, and I wrote it inside to Fred. Uh, I hope this book uh, helps you play rock drums. I love your work. I've seen all your movies, blah, 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 something like that. Call mine a piece. He said, oh, great. He's going to love this. All right. So a couple of weeks later, uh, we're rehearsing at Rod's. And I go in, you know, we go into the kitchen and Rod's publicist says, oh, there's a letter here for you. It says, call mine a piece. So it's for you. So I said, who's it from? He goes, I don't know. There's no address or not. And it said, Ava Productions. So I opened the letter up. I was very excited. I don't know what it was. And I, I ripped the envelope up, threw it away. And I opened the letter. 
It's a letter from Fred Astaire. Wow. It says, Dear Carmine of Peace, thank you for the book with the lovely inscription. I've enjoyed your work many times. Keep it up. Love, Fred Astaire. And I went, oh, my God. I cannot believe I got a letter from Fred Astaire through Gregory Peck. <laughs> I said, this is like, you know, unbelievable. Pinch yourself. This is like a kid from Brooklyn, you know, grew up to, to achieve this. This is unbelievable, you know. And it just goes to show that you, a guy who's just hanging out at the bar with Zeppelin, The Doors, Who, Jeff Beck, all these legendary guys, but the guy that you really, that was really impresses you is a Hollywood actor. <laughs> yeah, because he was Hollywood royalty, you know. I mean, you know, all these other guys were guys coming up when we were coming up. You know, like Jimi Hendrix, I knew him before he was Jimi Hendrix. He was Jimmy James. He used to play the clubs in New York. We played gigs with him. We played we played a half hour, he played a half hour. You know, and we'd smoke joints together and he'd talk about making it. And I really didn't care about making it. I just want to make a living playing music like my drum teacher did, you know? And he would he would have dreams of making it being being big and being a you know a big record artist, and that didn't happen to me uh, until two years, two or three years later, when I ran into him again in London, when he was Jimi Hendrix. Because when I saw pictures of him, I saw pictures of him playing with his teeth. I said, that looks like Jimmy James, because he played uh -huh. with his teeth also. Except his hair used to be slicked back, and now his hair had the afro, which started mm -hmm. a whole new, you know, um, hairstyle for the for the African-American community, you know? So I said, you know, that must be Jimmy James. So when we made it with Vanilla Fudge, we went to London. We're at the Speakeasy in London, and we're in the restaurant, and he comes in. So I go up to him. I said, Jimmy, you remember me? I played with you at the Lighthouse and a few other clubs. I had this group, the Three Beats. Oh, well, maybe it was Thursday's Children. I can remember. And we played... You know, and we smoke joints, and he goes, yeah, yeah, I kind of remember that. He says, what are you doing here? I said, I'm, van I'm in Vanilla Fudge. He goes, man, I love the fudge, he says. I said, oh, how cool, you know? Because, you know, it came from the same thing, the same area. He played all the clubs that we played in New York, you know? And that was very cool to see that he made it, and then I went there, he sort of remembered, and he loved the band. And then we toured a lot with Hendrix. So you, you know you're you're doing all this um, heavy metal stuff, this 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 hard rock stuff, but also you know in the late in '69, '70, or so the Motown sounds happening, James Brown's happening, the Temps, the Tops. Um, how many of these guys did uh, Rare Earth? I mean, did you have a whole lot of interaction or mutual respect for the R&B side of things at the time? Totally. I mean, we we did a lot of R&B stuff, you know. We used to do a lot of Temptations. It's growing. Uh, I'm so ain't too proud to beg. Um, that was another one we did. Uh, oh, and then we did the impressions. People get ready. You know. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. We did. We did um, uh, Aretha Franklin stuff. You know. And then we did Beatles. You know. But when we started doing our album, that's when we started uh, the product. We were doing production numbers. That was the thing going around. Uh, Long Island at the time, it, was, it, it came down from the Rascals and went to the Vagrants, which had Le Leslie West in it. And it was called Production Numbers, where everything would be slowed down. But, you know, the way we slowed down, we took lyrics and we created the musical environment for the lyrics instead of just slowing down anything, you know. Like if you look at You Keep Me Hanging On, it was an up-tempo song. Set me free, why don't you, babe? You know, like that. And it's... It, you know, it's it's a sad song, but it was done in a happy spirit, mm -hmm. you know? So that happy spirit didn't translate for us musically. So we created a more of an emotional, hurting environment. When we go, set me free, you know, it, it's almost like yelling, singing and yelling, but you feel the emotion. But know? ironically, it's, it's, it's almost more soulful. Exactly. Very... We did it more soulful. And when we did like People Get Ready, which was soulful in the beginning, mm -hmm. we made it, it sounded to us more like a gospel song. So we did the song with the organ and the vocal. I sang it and I had the rest of the band singing gospel higher uh, 
harmony behind me, you know? And then by the end, we built it up and raised the key, modulated it, and really brought the energy to the end. And it was it was done like a gospel thing. Ellen the Rigby, you know, was done fantastic by the Beatles. But if you listen to the lyric, it was very, very, uh, you know, eerie. Mm -hmm. uh, cemeteries, churches, yeah. eerie, eerie stuff. So we set that mood for the eeriness in, in with that the organ. Song. Yeah, with the organ and just the way we did it. And, and the vocals were eerie sounding. We used di distant uh, uh, chord structures, you know, to make that weird, eerie kind of sound. You know? And with and, all those influences, that's why I find it somewhat ironic and, and obviously very interesting that uh, with all those influences and all those songs you could have uh, broke out with and, and redone, which you, you did several, of course, but um, it was a Supreme song that really took you over the top. How did that whole, how did that happen? Well, we, we, we cut the demo, you know, but we did notice when we played live gigs, we do all our other songs, but when we played that one, people would stop dancing and walk up to the stage and watch us because we were crazy. You know, and the sticks twirling and Tim Bogart looked like he was spastic, you know, and Mark Stein with his waving arms and, yeah. and everybody would come up and watch us. And we, so we said, whoa, that's interesting. You know, so when we we went in and, and Shadow Morton said, let's record that song because he saw us live and saw the reaction of the people. So we went in and we recorded that a one take mono. Wow. I think we did all the vocals and everything all together, right, to the, right down to, to tape. And I always say it's seven and a half minutes that changed my life. Oh, sure. And hours too, buddy. Hours yeah, too. Yeah. And, and then he had friends on, on a new underground radio starting to happen. Murray the K and, uh, and Scott Muni in New York. They had WOR FM was just starting to play underground stuff. So, he gave them the demo, and they had like a rate the record on there, like a contest. They would always play three songs and have the audience call in and vote. So they put You Keep Me Hanging On on with like the Beatles and the Beach Boys and us, and we won. And then wow. they put us on with, with you know, uh, whoever was, the Beatles and the Kinks, and mm -hmm. we won, you know. And then Atlantic Records was listening, and through that, they signed us. Except wow. we, we weren't called the Vanilla Fudge yet. We, I think we were called the Pigeons at the <laughs> time. And then we cha they said, we hate that name. we got to change it. And we met a woman that said, you guys are like White Soul, Vanilla Fudge. And we said, oh, that's interesting. Wow. Okay. So that's how we got Vanilla Fudge. White Soul. I love that. Yeah. So, you know, we're going back. We're in the late 60s at the beginning of, um, of, uh, of, of, of metal, of hard rock of psychedelic rock, but it wasn't called that then. You didn't know that you were starting a whole genre no. of music. No, were we you just, what were you calling it back then? What were you referring to, uh, to it, that back then? Symphonic rock. Symphonic. Yeah, symphonic rock, because I was, you know, I started psychedelic symphonic rock, because there were some uh, classical elements in our stuff, you know? The build-ups and crescendos and dynamics. You know, we're like in hanging on, dun, do it, dun, do it, dun, do it, dun, do it, do it, then, shuck, and then do, 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 you know, all dynamics, like like classical music. You have a big, you know, all the big orchestra, and then all of a sudden there's a violin or a flute, you know. Well, it's, it's a real precursor to progressive rock, really. Yeah, you know, totally. Especially when Mark did his thing, you know. He did, because we had time signatures and, and our stuff. You go in and out, 6, 8, into 4, 4, 3, 4, and into uh -oh. 4, 4. You know, we had different time signatures going. And One second here. Let's see what's happening. What happened? Did you freeze? Uh-oh. I think we lost Ron. Ron, we lost Ron. Why don't you uh, set up the video and we'll play that while I try and get him back. Okay. Yeah, let's there we that. go. How about oh, now? There's, there's Ron. Yeah. We got you there back. I don't know what happened. There we go. Okay. So, well, anyway, that was I don't a know good what happened trip. there. That was a good trip. Yeah. That. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm a very talented uh, individual when it comes to yeah. computers. I mean, how could somebody so non-knowledgeable of a laptop <laughs> make stuff happen? I don't know. <laughs> You're like me. <laughs> so, 
let's uh, let's fast forward a little bit here. Um, guys like uh, like Jeff Beck, you know, that you started to do some projects with. Um, did you did you get close with him because of your connection with Led Zeppelin? A few of those guys. How did that relationship? Well, happen? It actually, we we love Jeff Beck. And one time, uh, we had the same attorney. Uh, I didn't tell you this story. It's in the book as well. Um, we were doing a co-commercial, Vanilla Fudge, right? An audio co-commercial, like things go really? bad, we coke, you know, that kind of thing. And and our guitar wait, player. Wait, 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 go back to that. Go. What was the coke commercial? It was. Audio, an audio. Yeah, let me hear it. 20,000 eyes upon you, 20,000 ears tuned in to the things we say, to the words we say. But the Coke we drink on stage helps fill with something. I don't know. Uh, Things go better with Coca Cola, you know. Really? Yeah, so what happened was Vinny got sick. So we were stuck. We were like, who are we going to get? Jeff Beck was in town. So our attorney called Jeff, and Jeff. We asked Jeff if he'd do the commercial with us. He said, yeah, because he loved Vanilla Fudge, too. Wow. So he came out, and he played on these two co-commercials. We did two vers- two two songs that we, we wrote, you know, and Jeff played on them. That's the first time we played together with Jeff, and Jeff loved playing with me and Tim. So later on, when we did a gig with Jeff Beck Group 10 years after uh, – Edwin wow. Hawk singers, you know, Oh Happy Day. You remember that song? Oh, sure. Yeah, and, and Vanilla Fudge. Jeff Beck group was playing. Led Zeppelin went up and, and jammed with them. And, you know, I mean, how do you follow that? Jeff Beck group with Rod Stewart and Ronnie Wood jamming with Led Zeppelin. And we had to go on. That was probably when we realized it's time to move on, you know, and that we started Cactus. And because guitars were coming more dominant in the music. And that night... Uh, after John Bonham took off his clothes on stage, and my mother and father said, why did he do that? We don't know. And he came in the dressing room and handed me Jeff Beck's phone number and said, Jeff wants to play with you and Tim. So we said, really? Because we want to play with Jeff. So we called him uh, when he got back home, and we started setting up, you know, that we're going to play with each other. And just before he came over with, with Peter Grant, his manager, to line it up, he got in a car wreck. I put him out of, out of business for 18 months. So in that 18 months, we had already broke up Vanilla Fudge. We had the name. It was going to be Cactus. It's going to be me, Tim, uh, Jeff, and Rod. That would have been Cactus. Wow. And then Rod didn't want to work with Jeff, you know. And uh, you know, she said, what is Jeff like in person? Je- Jeff was a, you know, a good guy, pretty much, when you're playing with him. He was a good guy. Very shy. Yeah, very mm-hmm. shy kind of guy. But uh, so we started Cactus, and then when he was ready to come back 18 months later, we were already doing Cactus, and he put the Jeff Beck Group Volume 2 together, and he did that for about six months, and then he con- they contacted us and said, Jeff still wants to play with you guys. And that's when we joined Jeff, and we did the first tour as a Jeff Beck Group featuring me and Tim and Jeff. Wow. And then, then the next tour, was uh, we did the album, then we did Beck Bogan a piece. Yeah. Talk about a super group, man. It was great playing. It was, we had such great times. So let's go to your buddy, Rod Stewart. I mean, uh, you know, you it, spent so what, how many years? 12, 15 with him? No, I, was only, I was only eight years with him. but Eight years, yeah. I, I did get him to write the intro to my book. Yeah, you know, I was, saw that. I mean, it seems like you guys are so close. Yeah, I mean, we, we, you know, we, we, we went through a bad time um, when he fired me. As he said in there, you know, uh, I think I can curse on this thing, right? Uh, sure. He said, I fired Carmine, fuck knows why, you know? And uh, there he is. You see those there doors? Those are. are the kind of doors Gregory Peck had, too. You see them doors? They look like a castle. And uh, that was a Rod Stewart group number two. And, uh, you know, but we, we got over that. And then we, I got Rod and Jeff back together. That's a whole other story. That's in the book, too. Cause Rod, That's legendary. That's legendary. Yeah, Rod and Jeff had a feud going for years, and we ended up in a hotel together in, in Australia, right? And, uh, and I ran into Jeff, and Rod was in the same hotel. And, you know, uh, I said, hey, why don't you come to the show tomorrow? And he just played a show in the same venue. We played two nights, and then we played the stadium, you know? 
And he said, no, nah, Rod won't want me to come. I said, no, nah, I'll check it out. So I talked to Rod. He goes, yeah, have him come. So the next day when he came, he walked in the dressing room. It was like time stood still for a minute, you know, because nobody knew what to do. So I went over to Jeff and I said, ah, come on in. And I said, Jeff, you know Rod. I said, Rod, you know Jeff. And they looked at each other and they came, walked each other. And they gave each other a hug. Oh, nice. Next thing you know, they're, they were friends again. And then... Jeff stayed with me for like two weeks in L.A. Uh, well, in between projects. And, uh, you know, we were uh, we, I was not playing with Rod at the time, but we were all still friends. And Jeff said, man, is there somewhere we could do music? I know the same answer in your question about Rod, but this is interesting. It's okay. You know? uh, so he goes, I said, well, let's go to Dwayne Hitching's house, who was the guy that co-wrote Young Turks and helped me with Sexy that I presented with Rod. He had a little studio. So we went to his house and we were jamming. We're jamming this song. We're jamming. And Dwayne says, hey, how about this lick? It was do, 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 do. So Jeff picked it up and blah, blah, blah. So we started putting everything together. And I said, no, guys, this sounds like people get ready. Mm. I, I used to sing that with, with Jeff, with uh, Vanilla Fudge. So I started singing it with it. I said, it is people get ready. So oh. Jeff says, Yeah. Wow, we need somebody to sing it. Maybe we can get Rod to sing it, he said. I said, good idea. So we called Rod up, and his, the guy that gave me the, the same guy that gave me the envelope said, well, Rod's at Dan, Dan, uh, Dan, Dan, I forgot the name, uh, the Italian restaurant in Santa Monica Boulevard, uh, eating. So we said, okay, good. And those days there weren't any cell phones. So we went down there, meet Jeff and Dwayne. We had a cassette. So when we got there, Rob was just leaving. He was with some people. We said, hey, before you leave, come and listen to this in the car. So we played it from the car. We said, we want you to sing this. And he said, oh, man, people get ready. I love it. Next thing you know, a week later, we're in the studio. I had the headphones on. Mm -hmm. had Jeff over there, Rod over there. And since I sang the song, I wrote the lyrics out for Rod. I, told, I pointed to him where to sing, pointed to Jeff where to play. Then Jeff and him went to the pub. And me and this engineer and Dwayne Hitchney, we put the whole track together. And I, and then his manager calls me and says, Jeff's manager, hi, darling. He's you know, very English. He said, hi, darling. What would you like? How much you want for the track? I said, I don't want anything. Just give me a co-production credit. I don't care if it's co-produced by all four of us. He says, okay. So and the, then the song comes out, produced by Jeff Beck. Thanks to the boys. I said, ah. Uh, thanks a lot, right? Yeah, thanks a lot. And then they did the video. Did they even ask me and Dwayne to be in it or you know be involved? No. And you know, it's nice rock and roll, right? It's unbelievable, man. You know. Well, what's a what was a typical night? I mean, you see you see Rod in his videos. You see his style. You see him on stage. Just how colorful and crazy. What was a typical night after a Rod Stewart show? Well, you know, Rod was always either married or going out with someone. So he's never really got involved in all the crazy really? stuff that we did. Yeah. Uh, before that, he did. Like, you know, when he was with the faces and stuff. Mm -hmm. But but at this time, I mean, the craziest thing we'd do, like one of our roadies would would uh, would get a, um, a woman in, in the room and, and we'd all hide in the closets. You know, That's or behind, creepy. Or, or behind <laughs> the curtains. And then when he was like getting down with it, one of us would walk out and go, oh, hi, mate. And, we, and he'd go, oh, hi. And then we walk through the door and walk out the door. You know, and then he gets back into it. And then another one would do it. And That's one, funny, though. You know, and uh, we, we did a, another crazy thing, which is in the book. I can't remember then. Oh, oh, I know what it was. It was the, the sex police. Right? Okay. Sex police was something. If you notice, if there's some pictures of us with sex police T-shirts on. And what that was, if you had a woman in, in, the, in the room and you hear her coming up the street, so, uh, coming up the hallway of the hotel, sex police, we're the sex police. And you hear them all stomping their feet. Oh, they dragged that tune. Yeah, exactly. And it would be like 10 of them, you know. <laughs> and they would knock on, bang on your door, sometimes break the door down or just destroy whatever you had going for yourself in the room. So... And one time I was with a woman, and you know, we're getting down. I hear that coming up the uh, coming up the street, and, you know, the wall. And I said, I said to her, hold on, hold on, be quiet. She goes, why? I said, listen. And we heard it, and she goes, so? 
I said, if they hear you in here, they'll break the door down and they'll oh take all your clothes and throw them out the doorway and you'll be like running around with a towel. And she well, was, was with the record company and she didn't want to be caught in the room. Oh, man. So she actually got dressed and walked out. Oh, well, there's a there's a mood killer there. Oh, my God. <laughs> so you had also a really interesting story about sharing a house with Prince. Yeah, that was uh, that was in the early 80s, when, before he really made it. Uh, Cavallo Ruffalo and Farnoli were managing him. It was a woman named Jamie Shoup, who's a good friend of mine, that was working for them. And we, we were talking with them about managing Vanilla Fudge, and we're hanging out with them. And Farnoli, we know from the days, the beginning of Vanilla Fudge, when, in Newport, Rhode Island, when we were just starting out. And now he was a big manager. Okay. So he wanted to get involved in us. And... Uh, and I would, I had just got oh, it. We lost it again. Let's see here. Uh, okay. Well, you were still moving on mine. But anyway, uh, so he he wanted to involved with Vanilla Fudge. Okay. And we, um, you know, we're hanging out with him. And Jamie was in this house, and she needed some money because uh, she was running behind on her payments. So I lent her some money, and she put me on the house uh, as a uh, a second as a second uh, mortgage kind of thing, you know? And I was getting divorced at the time, so I needed a place to stay. But I also had another girlfriend that lived in the same town, so I stayed mostly at her house. But I had a room there, and I had a bunch of stuff there, and I had my cars there. And, and she said, but you know, we have this young act named Prince that when he comes in, he doesn't like to stay in hotels. And he usually mm. stays in my house here, in that room. Is that okay? I said, yeah, it's okay, because, you know, I'm always staying at my girlfriend's house anyway. So so Prince used to come in and, and stay, and he'd go to the studio and come. So, you know, I would go in the house during the day and, like, get some clothes or grab something. I'd see Prince there. i go, hey, Prince, how you doing? You know, I'm all, like, uppity and, how you doing? He goes, I'm okay. But how did he get, and that I was mean, it. if he wasn't that, was that was big it. at the time... No. How did he get involved in a big group like yours? In in that house? Yeah. Well, it was my friend's house. Oh, I see. It was my, my friend Jamie's house, her, her house. It's a two-bedroom small house in Studio City, you know? And uh, so basically, you know, I would walk in the house later, and and he'd be very short with me, like, man, is that you? Is that is that you? Is that your track? He'd say, wow, it's really funky. It's really cool. Who's playing bass? Me, who's playing guitar? Me. Oh yeah. Who's playing drums. Me. I see yeah. you playing everything. I said, wow, that's great, you know. And then I got to know him, so he warmed up a little bit. I remember one time he played with the Rolling Stones at the uh, uh, Coliseum in L.A. and they booed him off the stage. Really? He came home. He was so depressed, and so me and Jamie were sitting around the table with a cup of tea, talking to him. And I said, hey, dude, don't even think about that, man. My first gig with Vanilla Fudge on the West Coast with the Mamas and the Papas, they were booing us too, but we 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 told them we're going to play whether you like it or not, so you might as well enjoy it, you know. And then we got off the stage and the boos went to the light, you know, clapping. So don't even worry about it, you know. And we're and he was, you know, we calmed him down and stuff. And then we got to know him more. And one time he wanted me to drive him to Hollywood because he didn't like taking taxis and he didn't drive. So I, I had a Pantera at the time, so I took him in the Pantera. Oh, wow. I got to say, I scared the hell out of him. I gotta <laughs> say. But he was a nice guy, you know. And, you know, he was so shy that I couldn't, I never saw him play. Finally, when he started getting big, he was playing Universal Amphitheater. And he invited me and Jamie and, and my girlfriend to see him. And uh, I went to see him. I went backstage and say hi to him and everything. And then... I, I'm sitting there watching him. He comes out in women's underwear, and he's laying on a mattress on the stage, having sex with the mattress on stage. And I turned to Jamie. I said, is this the same guy that lived in the house? Mm. I said, it was like a home. Came out of his shell, huh? Unbelievable. And then when they, when they did the premiere for uh, Purple Rain, he invited me to the premiere, and sitting next to me was Sheila E. Oh, yeah. She, before she was famous. Sure. And, I didn't know who she was. She didn't know who I was. And we, we talked and we got to be friends. So great that, lady. Great really, lady. Really great. You know, really great. And all this stuff's in the book. It's really, 
a good read, you know, with all this. Oh, I love it. You I've know, uh, like, I've, been blessed, much... I've been blessed with my life, you know. I had a lot of great stories, met a lot of great people, hung out with a lot of people, had a great career, did a lot of great playing, great gigs, you know. So you got a great book about your life. If there was a movie to come out about your life, this, uh, a friend of mine, Jack, asked this question, who would you like to play you in that movie? Oh, my God. <laughs> And I, if Brad Pitt I, wasn't I mean, it, it depends. It depends on you know what 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 where in my life they're starting, because you're gonna you're gonna have to get different people for young Carmine, a middle-aged Carmine, and the old Carmine, you know. But uh, I don't know. That's a good question. I'd have to research new actors, and then middle-aged actors and the older <laughs> actors. Well, I think uh, you know. Bad, I'm bad be remembering there. names. I'm better remembering Gregory Peck than I am with you know Brad Pitt and some of the guys today. Well, let's see if Brad Pitt, George Clooney, let's see what they're doing. There you go. Hey, um, so your brother, Vinny, yeah, Vinny, uh, just another legendary performer. Hopefully, we could do this kind of thing with both of you guys one day. Yeah, uh, yeah really look forward do to that. Do that. There's great. a lot of stories that that. And we can go into that a whole nother hour about the stories that, that cover you both. Look at that. That's a great that. hour. And you know what's funny about that picture? If you look at it, if you put your finger over Finney's forehead, two fingers uh -huh. to cover the forehead, it looks like the same face. But it's scary. It's really, both of our faces are stitched together like Frankenstein. <laughs> well, but he obviously, you know, he Black Sabbath, he's, uh, you know, with, with Dio. Um, there was a very special, interesting story about your bachelor party. <laughs> oh, yeah. That was a very interesting story. Uh, I think it was when I got married in 83. Uh, I've been married too many times and divorced. So I lost track what, myself. Yeah, I know. That's why I'm with my girlfriend 17 years. And she said, the people go, are you going to marry him? I go, marry him or marry anybody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Al Pacino, he, can, he, be, he could be the old me, Al Pacino. Uh, but anyway, so um, I, I was back in the day when I, I was getting married. So my manager said, hey, we're going to go to the strip bar and have like a, a drink with a couple of friends for you as your like bachelor party kind of drink for your wedding. I said, oh, OK, so we went there. And as soon as I walked in the lobby, I see Ronnie Dio there. I said, Ronnie, what are you doing here? He goes, I come here sometimes. I said, you do? Come all the way out here? Because it's like a half hour, 35 minutes from Hollywood and the Valley. I said, wow, that's amazing that you come all the way out here. So then I walk into place. And next thing I know, everyone goes, surprise! There's like 30 people, all my friends. Next thing I know, I'm on the stage with, with uh, 40 boobs taking a picture. you know. And then I find out that Ronnie actually hooked up that strip bar because he used to go to it, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he paid for it, you know, I'll tell you the truth, because he was that kind of guy. And, good and guy. A good guy. Yeah, that picture was at the bachelor party. Wow. That picture was at the bachelor party. And I remember it now. And and uh, Vinny reminded me that he, that's how it got hooked up. So, you know, we were friends all through the career that my brother played with Vinny, uh, with Dio, and, and basically Dio was was like a fourth brother. We have three brothers. He was like a fourth brother because he lived in L.A. He, he was Italian. Him and Vinny were the only two in, in all the bands he played that were Americans. So there was a lot of, in common. I knew him from when he was in Elf. He used to hang out at the Rainbow with, with Deep Purple. They were opening for Deep Purple, I believe. And uh, so we all got to be really good friends, you know. So when he got really sick, you know, we were in the hospital with him. And we saw him, you know, in really bad shape. And the next day he passed away. We uh -huh. went to the funeral, saw him in the coffin. We went to the, uh, the burial. I mean, it was just awful, you know. And uh, so years later, wasn't too much later, uh, we were doing a King Cobra album. And... Uh, I'm, I'm telling you the story of how this uh, this song Monsters and Hero came about and how, what we just did with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we were doing uh, an album with King Cobra. Paul Shortino was a singer. And we wrote this song. 
It was called Monsters and Heroes. It was going to be about Halloween, you know, your monsters and heroes like Frankenstein was your hero and the wolf man when you were a kid, you mm -hmm. know, and then, then Paul said, why don't we write this about Ronnie Dio, you know, called oh. monsters and heroes, dragons, rainbows in the dark. I said, wow, that's a great idea. So we did that. We recorded it with King Cobra, gave it to Wendy Dio, and then Wendy used it in her uh, Dio uh, Cancer Fund, right? And, mm -hmm. uh, and all the royalties from the King Cobra track went to Wendy. Five years later, we got it back. And by at that point, we were doing uh, mine and Vinny's album. So I said to Vinny, we should play this song because it's about Ronnie. Listen to it. And he loved it. I said, Paul used to be managed by Ronnie and Wendy. Ronnie produced Paul. So there was a, a good you know, connection with the three of us. So why don't we do it? And Paul's already on the song. We'll put you on it, Vinny, and this could be a song for the Peace Brothers. So we did that. Mm -hmm. And it came out on the album, and that was the main song, main video on the album. So then two and a half weeks ago, Vinny calls me and said, we want to do one of these lockdown videos. Mm -hmm. you know, everybody's doing where everybody's in a different place. So we said, let's do that. And we we decided to do it. And then Vinny said, we, we got, I would like to make this special somehow. I said, yeah, let's try and make it special, you know, for a good reason why we're doing this, not to just do it. Then sure. he said, you know what? In two and a half weeks, it's the anniversary of Ronnie's passing. It's a 10-year anniversary. Why don't we dedicate it to Ronnie, Vinny said, and get, do like a tribute. I said, oh, man, that's a great idea because this song is all about Ronnie. Sure. So I said, well, let's get somebody to be a PR guy to get us to do a bunch of interviews so we can get as many people to hear it, to mm -hmm. pay tribute to Ronnie along with us. So we can get, you know, some radio people and get it, you know, on all their social media and podcasts and this and that. So we did that. And then we completed the video. And the video is awesome because, you know, a lot of the bands do the video. That's like we are. There's a screen for me and a screen for you then a mm -hmm. screen for the bass player, and it just stays like that. But on this video, the screens move around along with the song. And it's, the song is high energy, and so is the editing on this video. So so we just released it today Wow! Uh, to all the radio, and to, we gave an MP3 to radio, interviews that we did, and everyone that we did, our PR guy sent out, plus I have a, some radio people that we sent out so they put, played it on the radio, put it up on their socials, on their websites. So we want to get as many eyes and as many people to have Ronnie Dio and this tribute on their lips. I mean, we're not making any money out of it because you know nobody makes money anymore in the music business. It's just the fact that we wanted to do this, and then we figured we, we did it for Ronnie and to keep him because we all miss him. Well, I love it. I love the project. I can't wait to hear it. I can't wait for you to come back to the Arcada with Cactus, with yeah, the man. Fudge, with Drum Wars, with yeah. anything else that you're going to be doing. I yeah, got to say that, that being with you tonight was so special for me, for everybody out there. You are a true rock and roll legend, but you're a true great guy. Thank we, you. We say long and live, Carmine. I, I can't believe it's been an hour. Wow. Oh, yeah. We could do this for hours. We'll do it again. Yeah. We'll do it, Vinny. We'll again. Do it again. Let's do it again. We'll bring Vinny on and we really have some fun. Well, Vinny's a, great, Vinny's it's a been comedian. Great hanging with you. It was a you great know, Vinny, hanging with you. Vinny's a comedian. You know that. He's always you know, making oh, everybody a, laugh. I tell you what, him. Last, I mean, the stuff that we do with him too. I just, you know, yeah. God bless the apathy of peace, mom. <laughs> God bless your mother. Yeah. When when Vinny started playing, it's in the book too, and and we wrote this on on a song on our album, Brothers and Drums. She said. He's driving me crazy like you did. Nah. Said to me. And we put that in the in the song when we were talking about Vinny starting to play and how he's playing all the time. And my mother said that. And then we continued the song. Well, but again, it's great. So much love to you, your brother, your family. Thanks. Long Thanks. live you guys. Um, can't That's wait good. to see it at the, not only at our theater, but all around the world. Um, it's been great on this crazy artist and lockdown episode, yep. but uh, wish you the best, man. I really, really Thank do. Thank you, man. Now let's play the video, okay, Ben? Let's, we have a producer named Ben. 
Ben Wheeler that's producing, putting up all these pictures. And thanks to them. And thanks to Steve Love Productions for putting this together. Yep. Thanks, Steve. Thanks to you, Ron, for being the, uh, the host. You're a great host. And Thank you. We love playing your venues. And, and you make the best meatballs. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. All okay. right, let's check out that video. There you go. I don't have any. I don't have any sound. It looks good. It's it's going out to the stream. Wow, what a song. What a song, man. Good song. Well, there's several different incarnations of it. 
Yeah, unfortunately, uh, the right side was not on. Uh, that's when my side was. See, we got Vinny on the left and me on the right. So what we heard was only Vinny's part. My part was somehow not on, so, but it's cool. The song so is great. The video is awesome. Do you guys plan on playing that if, when we do a drum war show? Oh, we always play it. We get the audience singing Monsters, and we go Monsters, and the audience sings Hero. You know, we did it with uh, King Cobra at the Sweden Rock Festival. We had the whole 8,000 people singing it with uh, King Cobra years ago. So. Well, it's been great spending this hour with you, buddy. You're All a rock. All right, dude. Legend. Thank you, bro. I love you, bro. Love you. All the best, man. All the okay, best. Long live soon. Vanilla Fudge. Long live Cactus. Long live all your projects. But more yeah. importantly, more long live Carmine. Love you, Thank brother. You. I'm saying with you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye. Thanks Bye. for joining us on Earth's Lockdown. See ya.